Alrighty, folks, let's make sure the microphone is working. Wachad talata tenen, achad shtayim shalosh. Yes? You hear me? Oh, yeah, that's devil speak. Arabic and Hebrew, that's definitely devil speak. Razdavatri, um, that's Russian, that's even worse. Um, let's see, and I've got a clicker, so I think we're all set. Um, you know, if ever anybody needed proof that atheists have some kind of inner heat, Today could be the day, right? It's pretty cold in here. Um, and if you have an irrational fear of math, now is the time to leave the room. Uh, the, let me see if I can get this to click. Uh, oops, so that goes that way. Oh, there we go. Okay, good. So just a quick, just super quick on the Pew Research Center. Main thing you need to know, Pew Research Center, we're in Washington, D.C. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan, and non-advocacy organization. We, have, we don't do any commercial work. We have no clients. We have no advertisers. We can't commission the Pew Research Center poll for any amount of money. Pew is not a religious name. It's a family name. The Pew family owned Sun Oil, Pennsylvania, Sunoco. Uh, a generation or two ago, they put that money into the Pew Charitable Trusts, several billion dollars in those trusts. They support, among other things, the work of the Pew Research Center, an independent kind of public interest uh, social science research center. And we study a lot of things. One of the things we study is religion. We study religion because we think it's consequential, not because we uh, advocate or promote any particular religion or non-religion or religion over non-religion. So we try not to have a dog in the fight. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about something you all know a lot about, uh, atheists. Um, but I'm going to try to give you some, some facts and figures from empirical research, and maybe some of them will be surprising to you. Um, we'll, we'll see, and I hope there'll be a little bit of time to talk about it afterwards. Uh, just first of all, obviously there are a lot of different ways one could define who is an atheist. Um, the simplest way, uh, the way we do it in research, and a lot of others do it, is to ask a closed-ended question about people's religion. So this is by self-definition. And if we ask a closed-ended question like the one we ask, which is, what is your present religion, if any? By the way, the if any sort of tamps down the social desirability of naming a religion. What is your present religion, if any? Are you Protestant, Roman Catholic? Uh, well, sometimes I say Orthodox, as in Greek or Russian Orthodox, Mormon, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, atheist, agnostic, something else, or nothing in particular. And in answer to that question, 3.1% of US adults self-identify as atheists. Now, if you ask the question in a slightly different way with a different set of response options, you get a slightly different number, okay? That doesn't mean that the, a, a different number is more correct or not correct. If you ask a different question, you're actually measuring something slightly different. So some other surveys will ask this in an open-ended way. No, they'll just say, what is your present religion, if any? no options, you actually get a few less people identifying as atheist if you do it that way. You get a few more people identifying as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular if you actually have those as prompts in the question. Very small methodological thing just to note. Now, not everybody who does not believe in God self-identifies as an atheist. I'm sure that's obvious to you, right? And in fact, the share of the American public of adults, 18 and older, who tell us that they don't believe in God is considerably higher than the share who say they're an atheist. But what you might not realize is the converse is also true. What I mean by that is, yes, in every religious group, there are a certain number of people who identify with a religious group who tell us that they don't believe in God. But there's a little surprise there too for you at the end. You'll see, for example, that among non-Christian religions, all non-Christian religions in the United States, that's about 6% of the US population, and that includes Hindus and Buddhists and Jews and uh, Muslims and uh, Wiccans and a whole lot of other things, 15% uh, of people in that category do not identify. Is that the, the right number, is it 15? Yeah, 15% do, uh, uh, tell us that they don't believe in God. Among Jews by religion, and by that I mean Jews who answer the religion question by saying their religion is Jewish, 17% tell us they don't believe in God. Among people who self-identify as Christian in any way, overall, 1% tell us they don't believe in God. But here's the little punch, you have to realize that among people who tell us that they're atheists, 
8% tell us they do believe in God or a universal spirit. That's not to make fun of anything. Look, atheists are human too. And human beings are not totally consistent in the way that they self-identify and then they express their beliefs and practices. And it could be that some people who identify as atheist don't actually know what the word means. Or it could be that, remember the question is, do you believe in God or a universal spirit? And it could be that some people have complex cosmologies and self-identities. Uh, now, um, of course, not everybody even who believes in God necessarily believes in God with the, you know, all the same degree of certainty. And so we also ask a follow-up question, uh, how certain are you uh, uh, in your belief in God? And 63% of Americans, which uh, in, uh, by comparison with other countries, are pretty high share, tell us they believe in God with absolute certainty. Again, this is all adults, so 63% of people 18 and older. 20% say they're fairly certain. 5% say they are not too or not at all certain. So if you wanted to add those to those who say they don't believe in God, now you're at about something like 14% or about one in six Americans who either tell us that they don't believe in God or that they do, but they're not too or not at all certain about it. So obviously there are a lot of different ways to identify who is an atheist. I would say from the point of view of a survey researcher, the most important thing is you wanna pick a consistent definition and you wanna ask that again and again in the same context in surveys that are done the same way and what you get that way is a valid trend line on what's happening to your numbers. And so when we do that, in very large national surveys, the National uh, Religious Landscape Survey that we do has 35,000 people in it. Uh, we've done it twice in 2007 and 2014. It's a very expensive and complicated um, and very high quality survey done by telephones and landlines, random digit dialing all across the United States. And what we find when we compare 2007 to 2014 is that over that period of time, uh, the share of Americans who identify as atheist has gone from 1.6% to 3.1%, and you all can do the math. That's a substantial uh, increase, and it is statistically significant uh, at a 95% confidence level for the statistically minded out there. Uh, overall, uh, atheists are rising, agnostics are rising, and people who identify with that nothing in particular category are rising. We tend to lump those three groups together at times and broadly call them the unaffiliated. That is, sometimes referred to as the nuns, the religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S. I'm sure you've heard that, num that, that term. Please don't confuse, not all nuns are atheists, right? Actually, atheists are a minority of the nuns. In fact, two thirds of all Americans who don't identify with any religion fall in that nothing in particular category. And I'll just tell you politically and characterologically, um, in a whole lot of ways, there are some big differences between atheists and nothings in particular. Among other things, we tend to find, and I'll talk about this maybe a little bit later or in question and answers if you want, that atheists are extremely knowledgeable about religion. People who fall into nothing in particular category are not especially knowledgeable about religion. In fact, many people in the nothing in particular category are just kind of indifferent to religion. It's not particularly important in their lives. Many of them are believers. And in fact, overall, of all of the nuns, 61% tell us that they do believe in God. 20% tell us that they pray on a daily basis. Those are considerably lower levels, though, of religiosity than we see in the general public. Okay. I think this is going to get more interesting. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the profile of nuns in general and of atheists in particular. Now, very importantly, this slide, you see that there's a, like a summary and a hundred at the bottom. That's a clue you need to read, very important, you need to read these columns down, not across. What this is telling you is that of atheists in America, 5% are in the silent or greatest generations, the World War II and immediate post-World War II generation. 18% are in my generation, the baby boom generation. 28% of atheists are in Gen X. And nearly half of all adult atheists in the United States are millennials. 
And if you look across at the other column for all US adults, you'll see an obvious fact, which is that atheists are disproportionately millennial. They're disproportionately young. It's a young group. And so you probably now want to know the other side of this equation, right, which is a different set of statistics, and that is not what share of atheists are millennials, but for example, what share of millennials are atheists. And so again, please don't be confused about this. Um, those are gonna be two different sets of numbers, right? Um, now, w by generation, um, religious nuns are making up a considerably higher share of each recent generation, and uh, atheists are also rising. Uh, just 1% of folks in the silent and greatest generation self-identify as atheists, 2% of baby boomers, 3% of Gen X, and 5% of millennials. And you also see that if you look at the nuns, the nuns are rising generationally, really to, to, a, to a very rapid uh, clip, uh, such that uh, a fully a third or more of millennials today do not identify with any religion. In fact, if we divide millennials, our big generation now, and if we look at younger millennials versus older millennials, we see that the younger millennials are even more uh, un unaffiliated than older millennials. So this trend, this pattern is continuing by age. All right, I'm gonna quickly, because I've got some more interesting things, I'm gonna just quickly give you some demographics uh, uh, of the atheist population. It won't surprise you to know the atheist population is predominantly white, and in fact, more white than the US population as a whole. Uh, probably won't surprise you to know that, the, that atheists live all across the country, everywhere, um, in all the major parts of the country, including in the South and including in the Midwest. But in comparison with the distribution of the US population as a whole, atheists are a bit more uh, likely to be found in the West and in the Northeast. I don't think there's any surprise there, right? Um, Education-wise, um, it won't surprise you to know that atheists on the whole are a little better educated than the US uh, public. But nonetheless, I hope you appreciate that the majority of atheists in the United States, like the majority of US adults, actually are not college educated. See that? Okay, uh, and uh, quickly uh, on the knowledge uh, question, you see for example, and this is, this is not percentages, this is the number of questions out of 32 knowledge questions that we asked that various people in various religious groups got correct on average. This is a different survey, a wonderful survey. At, uh, um, uh, take a look at it sometime on our website at pewresearch.org. But you'll see that overall, atheists and agnostics have the highest levels uh, of religious knowledge in the country, tied um, statistically with Jews and Mormons. Um, nothing in particular, folks, are considerably lower, actually. Um, and education is a complicated thing. It, it is kind of true, the relationship between education and religion in the United States is something we've taken a serious look at uh, in recent years. Um, you're right in your basic um, sort of assumption that as education rises, levels of atheism also tend to rise. Um, but there are some complications and the relationship is not quite as linear as you might think. Uh, three quarters, roughly, of Americans identify with a religious group, and people who are college educated are just as likely to identify with some religion as people who don't have a college education. But college educated people actually are a little bit more likely to identify with non-Christian religions. Um, and if you look at Christians, just Christians, you find something interesting. Uh, Christians are 70% of the US population, uh, and you find overall that Christians with a college education are just as religious by a variety of measures, that's what this slide is showing, as Christians with lesser levels of education. So within religious groups, you don't necessarily find a clear relationship that higher levels of education lead to less religiosity or lower levels of belief. Okay, let's quickly talk about politics. It won't surprise you to know that the unaffiliated as a whole, and atheists in particular, lean democratic, democratic. Although, you know, not, not, not everybody, right? Um, so there's still 15% 
of atheists to are Republicans or lean Republican. Now these date numbers are a little out of date. They're 2014 and they may have changed, but nonetheless. Uh, most atheists uh, identify as liberal. Again, I think that's probably not a surprise. Maybe you're even more surprised that a few uh, do self-identify politically as conservative. Um, large majority of atheists favor legalized abortion. Large majority of atheists say that homosexuality should be accepted by, by society rather than that society should discourage homosexuality. And uh, overwhelmingly, uh, atheists support uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, again, I think there are not a lot of surprises there. Um, might be interesting for you to realize uh, that atheists as of 2014, I'm sorry, the unaffiliated as of 2014 uh, make up a very large share, 28% uh, of the democratic coalition. In fact, the nuns, the unaffiliated, are, uh, if you don't lump all Christians together, but divide Christians into the major traditional uh, traditions, you, you could make a case that the unaffiliated are actually the largest single group of, uh, of democratic voters. Uh, and of that number, um, though it's not shown on this slide, atheists made up 5% of Democrats and Democratic leaning voters as of 2014. Um, now, unfortunately, and you can't blame me for this, folks, because I don't do the exit polls. The exit polls are done uh, by a consortium of media organizations, um, and, and they pay for the exit polls, and the exit polls don't ask about atheists. Um, the, the, the response categories for religion in the exit polls are Protestant, Catholic, Mormon, other Christian, Jewish, Muslim, other or none. Uh, but what we can see is that um, the share of adults who are nuns far exceeds the share of voters who are nuns. So in that sense, one of the things to realize about the unaffiliated, they're a rising share of the US population, but they punch below their weight politically. They are not turning out to vote uh, commensurately with their numbers. And you know that's very interesting. You remember that in 2012 and uh, 2008, probably for the first time in US history, African American voters turned out fully in proportion to their share of the population. Hispanics continue to be underrepresented um, um, as a share of voters compared to their share of the electorate. Um, I don't know where atheists are. It, it's entirely possible that although the unaffiliated as a whole don't turn out in proportion to their share of the population, that atheists do. That could be the case, but I don't know that. Uh, again, partly uh, because the, the, the unfortunately the exit polls don't ask that. Um, now, let's get into what's, I think, probably the most interesting thing, and that is we've, we've already seen uh, atheists in particular and the nuns as a whole are growing. The growing is a share of the U.S. population. Uh, what's going on there? Why is that? Um, the simple answer is religious switching. Uh, um, we ask people how they were raised, in what religious group they were raised, and we ask them what religious group they are today. We don't ask people whether they've converted or changed, we just ask what they are today and how they were raised, and we compare the two. And here's what we can see. Um, the share of people in being raised as nuns, being raised without any religious identification, has been rising by generation. Overall, 9% of US adults tell us that they're not raised in any religion, but it's 13% of millennials. The share who are raised as atheist also has probably been rising, but very uh, slowly, and the differences are not statistically significant. Now, you know what um, Woody Allen said about casual sex, right? Uh, he said casual sex is a meaningless experience. But as meaningless experiences go, it's one of the best. <laughs> I would say here, the, 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 the increase in the share of people raised as 
atheist is statistically insignificant. But as statistically insignificant things go, it's one of the more interesting. Um, so we can dig a little deeper into this. And I personally find this a fascinating slide. And so let's take a moment to look at it. I'll start with the bottom line and look at mainline Protestants. And what this is telling us is that if you start all the way in the far bottom corner, the lower right-hand corner, you'll see that 53% of people, I'm sorry, of mainline Protestants in the silent, 53% of people in the silent generation who were raised as mainline Protestants are still mainline Protestants. 47% are not. And of baby boomers, 47% of baby boomers who were raised as mainline Protestants are still mainline Protestants. 44% of Gen X and 37% of people in the millennial generation who were raised as mainline Protestants are still mainline Protestants. So that is a very low retention rate. And you'll note with all of the major religious groups that I've shown here, that their retention rates are declining by generation. So look at Catholics. 73% of Catholics in the silent generation, or 73% of people, sorry, in the silent generation who were raised as Catholics are still Catholic. Of millennials, just 50% of people who were raised as Catholic are still Catholic. Now look at the unaffiliated numbers, and they're highlighted. They're, there, the retention rates are moving in the opposite direction. So 26% of people who were raised in the, 26% of silent generation folks who were raised as, raised with no religion, still have no religion. So the vast majority have gone on to take on a religion. But 42% of baby boomers, 47% of Gen X, and fully two thirds of millennials who were raised with no religion still have no religion. So the retention rate is increasing by generation. Well, we can dig into this another way. We can look uh, at the share of Americans uh, who are fall into all these various categories. So uh, we'll start here with the column that's on the left and go down to the unaffiliated 9.2%. Earlier I showed you nine, rounded. It's the actual figure is 9.2% of US adults tell us that they were raised with no religion. Now, 4.3% of US adults tell us that they were raised with no religion and have gone on to take on some religion. But 18% of US adults were raised with some religion and now have no religion. Now don't identify with any religion. Now identify as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. With the result that today, 23%, rounds to 23% of US adults do not identify with any religion. So you following me on that? What we're looking at is the share who were raised in each group, how many have left, how many have entered, and what's the current religion. So if we take a look at Christians across the very top line, 85%, actually it rounds up to 86% of American adults tell us they were raised as Christians. And 19% of US adults were raised as Christians and are no longer Christians. Just 4% of US adults were not raised as Christians and have become Christians, with the result that today 70% of US adults, 70.1, or 71%, sorry, 70.6 rounds to 71% uh, today identify as Christian. Um, I could leave you to puzzle over this a little bit more, but let's just now look at these things in terms of retention rates, because it will show you something interesting. While the number of people who are raised with a religion is much bigger than the number of people who are raised without a religion. So even though you have a, a relatively large share of people who are raised with no religion who go on to take on a religion, you have many more people who are raised 
in some religion who've left. That's why you have that imbalance that I showed in the previous slide. But if you look just at the share of people raised in each group who are still in that group, actually what you find is that the unaffiliated as a whole and atheists in particular have relatively low retention rates. So uh, of the unaffiliated, 53% of people who are raised with no religion still have no religion. And of atheists, 39% of people who are raised as atheists are still atheists today. The majority of people who tell us they were raised as atheists have gone on to take on a religion. Now America is a very vibrant religious marketplace and there's a lot of switching in a lot of directions and you gotta bear in mind the size of the groups are not the same. So let's just kind of do a little thought experiment. Uh, and at least for as a starting point, we'll take the year 1980, because in 1980, 95% of Americans identified um, uh, with some religion, overwhelmingly with Christianity, and 5% were unaffiliated. So if we start with that, as things were in 1980, and then we apply what are the actual retention rates that we see in our surveys, uh, that is, that 53% uh, of the people who are raised with no religion are still no, in no religion, 47% have left, and 80% uh, uh, of the people who are raised with a religion still are affiliated in some religion, maybe not the same one, but still affiliated in some religion, 20% have left, and we apply those um, to, to, the, to, the, to the very big differences in the size of the population, um, this is what happens in, in time two, because you have 19 people out of 100 leaving the affiliated category, and only two people going from the unaffiliated category to the unaffiliated category. The unaffiliated number is gonna grow. It's gonna grow, so at time two, so remember, let's go back. Here was time one, this is time two. Okay, even though the retention rate of the unaffiliated is not, as, is not as high, even though the affiliated have a higher retention rate, there's so many more people affiliated to begin with that the movement is in the direction of the unaffiliated. Now, if we continue with that, those same and apply those same retention rates, and at time three, you end up with 27 out of 100 people, so it's still growing, right? Went from 22, now at time three, if you apply those, or a third generation, if you will, then you're gonna have still a higher share of the population that's unaffiliated, and time four, but something interesting happens around time five, which is you get to um, a, a, a balance, and you get a point at which, with those stable retention rates, but different population sizes, uh, you reach a point of harmony um, in which now, the populations, they're still switching back and forth, but the populations are stable. And I raise this with you not because this is a prediction of what will happen, but you should understand that just because the unaffiliated and in fact the share of atheists are growing through religious switching at present, and I see no reason for that trend, no particular reason for that trend to stop, but the population sizes to begin with are so different that if the current retention rates in the two groups were, were, were to continue, it doesn't go on forever. It's like the population doesn't totally flip and become completely unaffiliated. Not if both groups still have some movement from one group to the other group, right? At some point, and there's, you could do the mathematics, it's very complicated, but there are lots of potential points um, of stability, depending on what those retention rates are. And the retention rates are not stable. The retention rates are changing. And if the retention rate of the unaffiliated continues to grow, then it is possible that the unaffiliated could continue to grow. But it only happens if that retention rate also increases, okay? Um, and let's just talk about a couple of other things. Um, you know, if you think about change, demographic change in religious populations, in general, 
uh, religious switching in a place like the United States is, is a huge factor. Worldwide, a bigger factor is fertility um, and differing fertility rates by religious groups depending on where people live. People living in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, uh, their populations are growing, religious groups are growing at a much faster rate, for example, than those who live in Europe or North America. But uh, in the United States, I can tell you for sure that the growth of the unaffiliated is not caused by higher fertility. Because in fact, as we can see from this slide, the unaffiliated and atheists, in fact, in general, have uh, lower fertility than the overall population. This actually led some people, um, uh, uh, some very smart people, uh, 15, 20 years ago to write books suggesting that um, uh, the religion, religious folks would take over the world because uh, unaffiliated or take over the United States because the unaffiliated have and, and uh, non-religious people have lower birth rates. But of course, again, birth rates are not the only factor. Uh, there's also religious switching, immigration, a lot of things that, um, that get involved in the change in population sizes. Um, and last but not least, let's talk briefly, um, and then I'd be glad to do some questions and answers about religious change. Um, why are the nuns growing, those kinds of things. Um, I thought you'd be interested a little bit in what we can see about uh, public attitudes uh, and frankly discrimination against atheists. And we have a few different ways to measure this. Um, one is a political measure. Uh, we've typically asked this early in election cycles. We've done it a few times. Uh, this is from the 2016, early in the 2016 election cycle. Uh, we asked a question that goes like this. Would you be more likely to vote for a candidate who is X, less likely to vote for a candidate who is X, or would it not make much difference to you if a candidate were X? And then we fill in that X with a variety of things, some of which turn out uh, in public opinion uh, to be uh, uh, overall beneficial uh, to, to the candidate. Uh, so having served in the military, 50% uh, of American uh, uh, adults tell us they would be more likely to vote for someone who served in the military. Just 4% say they'd be less likely to vote for someone uh, who served in the military. Despite a lot of skepticism about uh, the Ivy League, et cetera, still uh, um, having attended a prestigious university on balance is probably um, uh, better um, for the candidate. Uh, being Catholic on balance is a help. Uh, being Jewish on balance, kind of really no, no difference. 8% are more likely, 10% are less likely. 80% says it wouldn't matter. Um, similarly, actually being an evangelical uh, Christian, 20% say they'd be more, 22% say they'd be more likely to vote for a candidate who's evangelical Christian, 20% less likely, and 55% say it wouldn't matter. Of course, this is a hypothetical candidate, not a real flesh and blood person. Um, obviously, that could make a big difference. Uh, I always uh, find it uh, interesting that being a Mormon is the functional equivalent in American politics of having ever smoked marijuana. Uh, that is, almost identical numbers say uh, that they would be more likely to vote for someone who's a Mormon who are, or has smoked marijuana. Almost identical numbers say they would be less likely, and almost identical numbers say it wouldn't matter. Um, and overall, having used marijuana in the past or being a Mormon uh, is a little bit of a negative factor. Now, we didn't ask about the word atheist. We use the term does not believe in God. And you'll see that of all the things we asked, now we didn't ask about a child abuser, we didn't ask about an ax murderer, but of all the, of all the things that we asked about, um, the most negative one uh, um, in the eyes of the US public overall uh, is uh, being in, uh, the not believing in God, although you'll note that a substantial share of the public, 41%, says it wouldn't matter. And if you add the, four, the 6% who says they'd be more likely to vote for a person who's, who doesn't believe in God to the 41% who say it wouldn't matter, that's almost equal, roughly equal to the share who say they'd be less likely. Still, still, <laughs> you can see um, um, it's, it's a negative uh, in, in politics overall. Again, this is not taking account of geographic distributions and, and real flesh and blood candidates. Another, another way we can ask this question, it's a little bit hokey, but we do something called a feeling thermometer. Feeling thermometers have proven over the years to be able, it's a way that you can ask people uh, difficult questions and yet they will answer and the data makes sense. And frankly, if you just call somebody up on the telephone and you say, hey, tell me, uh, what do you think about black people? 
Uh, what do you think about Jews? What do you think about Catholics? It's, it's, a, it's a very off-putting question, and the data that it gets uh, is not very good. Uh, so we don't do that. Uh, but the feeling thermometer works, and the way the feeling thermometer works is, um, well, first of all, we do this self-administered, as we used to do it for an online panel. It's not opt-in online, it's a chosen representative panel of Americans, um, and, but they're, they're, they're answering this in the privacy of their own homes on a, on a computer without talking to any other person. And they're asked, they said, imagine a feeling thermometer of zero to 100, where zero is the coldest, most negative feelings, 50 is neutral, and 100 is the warmest, most positive feelings. Now, where on this feeling thermometer would you put, and we can ask about all different, we can ask where would you put black people, where would you put women, where would you put Hispanics, where would you put uh, 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 Ivy League graduates. Uh, we can also do it with the religious groups. And when we do it with the religious groups, um, what we see, um, and I always find Jewish audiences are stunned by this, but overall, uh, Jews are the most warmly regarded uh, major religious group in the United States, uh, pretty much tied with Catholics, um, um, atheists, uh, are down at, at, at toward toward the bottom um, uh, with with Muslims. Um, uh, um, and um, finally, uh, we can ask people, well, how much discrimination do you think there is against various groups? Do you think there's a lot? Do you think there's some? Do you think there's not too much? Do you think there's none at all? And here I'm just showing the share who say they think there's a lot of discrimination against various groups. And you'll see that Two-thirds of Americans think there's a lot of discrimination against gays and lesbians. Uh, six in 10 Americans roughly think there's a lot of discrimination against Muslims. Half think there's a lot of discrimination against blacks and Hispanics. A third think there's a lot of discrimination against Jews. About one in four think there's a lot of discrimination against atheists, uh, roughly equal to the share who think there's a lot of discrimination against evangelical Christians. Um, and um, I, uh, as you know, uh, I'm a nonpartisan, non-advocacy research center, so I don't comment on these findings. I just leave them to you. And with that, I would, um, that's a very quick uh, overview of some of the data that we have uh, on atheists and on uh, unaffiliated Americans. It's all available, all publicly available with methods, statements, et cetera, on our website at pewresearch.org. Um, and do I have time to entertain a couple of questions? Can I take one question? Over here, let me, let me get the mic to you. I think the analysis and the presentation are great. The question I have is how do you get decent polling data today? No one wants to pick up the phone or respond to an email. Everyone thinks it's spam or junk. And you said a lot of the yeah. surveys were landlines. What percentage of the population has landlines? So yeah. tell me about your database. So you have to do both landlines and cell phones if you're doing phone uh, phones. Uh, though increasingly, our ratio now is like 75% uh, of calls on cell phones and 25% on landlines, and it's been rising and it'll continue to rise. Uh, the interesting thing that's happened with uh, response rates um, is that they are low, but they have stabilized, which is a good thing. So it's about one in 10 numbers that we identify, that we try to reach, that are working uh, numbers, residential numbers, or cell phone numbers. We're actually able to compute complete an interview with, with the number that we have chosen at random, about one in, one in 10. And that's low, but it has stabilized. Um, and, you know, cell phones and landlines, they kind of help each other out, actually, uh, because uh, landlines tend to skew older and, f and female, and cell phones tend to skew younger and male. Uh, now, when we do these surveys, we don't get a, a, a perfect um, representation of the public just naturally. Uh, we'll tend to, depending on the survey, get a few more women or a few more men, a few older people, a few less educated, a few more educated, then what's the distribution? But that's where we use weighting. And we weight, uh, uh, depending on the survey, we're always weighting nationally, but we can also weight uh, to various parts of the country. So we weight the data to be representative of the public. 
by gender, age, education, income, and a series of other demographic factors using census data. And then you ask, say to yourself, so with all these people who turned you down, how do you know then that what you've got is at all representative of the public? And it's simple, and you can all find all this on our website too, especially if you go to our methods pages. There's a variety of ways of doing it, but one thing is that we know what the correct answers are on some things. We know from very hot, from government data, government sen uh, uh, census data or surveys like the American Community Survey done by the Census Bureau that people are required to answer. We know what share of the population smokes and we know the demographic breakdown of that. We know what share of the population has driver's licenses and we know the demographic breakdown of that and so on. So we could set up a set of benchmarks. We've got about something like two dozen pretty good benchmarks we can see, we can put those questions in our surveys, do the telephone survey, weight the data so it's representative of the public, and see how close we get to the benchmark. And the good news is we are very close to those benchmarks again and again and again and again. So there's good reason to believe that survey data is still good data. But we don't only do telephone surveys anymore, we also do online panel surveys where we select a group of people. There we have much higher response rates. And around the world we also do face-to-face -face interviewing where our response rates are often 50% plus. And again, of that 10%, one thing to realize, so yes, of the numbers that we try to reach where we think it's a working number, we only complete an interview with about nine or 10% of the people. But the vast majority of those cases, it's because we never reach a person. It's not because the person turned us down. The cooperation rate, once we get a person on the line, is actually typically much higher. On many surveys, our cooperation rates are 50% and, and, and above. So, quick answer.